My name is Miles Morales. I'm Brooklyn's one and only Spider-Man. And things are going great. Phil and Chris, it's yes, so great hi. to chat with y'all. I've actually Likewise. sat next to one of you at yeah. one of these. So this is like old hat for you oh, yeah. now, right? Oh, so well, we sat next to each other like two years ago. Yes, this was with Billie, Billie Eilish. Eilish. Yes, we did. Oh, back here again. That's a good table. <laughs> can we be at the same table again? I don't know if we're going to be that cool, but I would love I to be remember. that cool. I remember. We had a good time here. It was a great time, a table that time. But what's it like being back at the luncheon and honestly with this film again and having the success again to have it recognized? I mean, we're, it's, we're just really happy for like the crew and the artists who made the movie. Like, it's a thousand people made the movie. They're yeah. all so proud of their work. We're really happy for them. And the other thing that's great is like, it's so nice for to hang out with other filmmakers. It takes four or five years to make these movies. We don't get to see each other <laughs> except yeah. like today. <laughs> Yeah, and, and be a chill in it. It's like not a pitch right. meeting. It's like, no, everyone's just here to celebrate. Yeah. Also, I love the film is being recognized as an animation. It's kind of, I think, a scary moment right now with animation where like mm -hmm. some people are, you know, treating these like tax write-offs. I mean, Sammy Birch is actually yeah. here. Yeah, what? how about that? Yeah, she's no, having a week. Yeah, she's having a week. <laughs> but what is it like for you guys, for the medium, and like what are you guys hoping, knowing that maybe we're probably going to get another Spider-Verse and, and knowing that, you know, it's having great moments, but also bad moments at the same time. And one of the things we're trying to do with these movies is demonstrate that like, you can make a really artistic, sophisticated, emotional movie that's a hit. And that resonate, the, the wilder you get, the, the harder it hits with the audience. Yeah, so, and that, that was what people really loved about the film, was like nothing they'd ever seen before. And so when a movie like that can be as successful as it can, it can tell other studios it's safe to push the envelope, it's safe to take risks. Uh, that's actually the that's good business, uh, yeah. and uh, and to respect the 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 medium of animation mm. as uh, as cinema, and understand that this is you know the history of animation is hand in hand with the history of film, mm. right? And so when you like shell the movie, <laughs> you know like you're not uh, honoring the community, the the broader film community. You know mm. it is still family business. <laughs> Fair. And a lot of these guys work on multiple projects. I mean, people that work at Pixar, work at Sony, and, and so on and That's so right. forth. Yeah. Uh, one thing I have to ask you guys as producers, you're very early into shaping these stories. Sometimes they get reshaped as you do it. When did Canon event happen? And oh, whose who's note, idea, so on and so forth? We were, it used to be called oh, Convergence goodness. Events, which sounded like homework. Right. And we were, we went to, every once in a while, we'll go to Amy Pascal's house and watch the movie, the three of us, and just go, how can it be better? <laughs> and uh, that canon events came out of that That's right. Meeting. Oh, wow. We so knew we wanted to, like, bust the canon, and then I was like, why should we just call it canon event? Because that's clear to everyone, and you can, it, it associates it with the whole world of the way things are supposed to be, which mm -hmm. is a bunch of nonsense in our opinion. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie to you, you wouldn't have had TikToks with Convergence events. No, like absolutely not. Right. So talk to me about when you <laughs> saw that moment, like, because that was such a TikTok moment. Yeah. Like, did you know that when you were doing it? Or were no. you surprised with it? Like, I mean, you think these two guys are like, I know how <laughs> to hack TikTok. Let's create a TikTok <laughs> meme. No, we, we knew that the, that little cue that Daniel Pemberton had done for Miguel O'Hara 2099, that was like special. so special. It like really stuck with us. It was really one of the first things he did for the movie. And we were like, this feels like the tone of what this character is. And, but, but, and it speaks to the spirit of the movie, which is like, it's, you know, nostalgia can get you killed, <laughs> right? And looking backwards is really not what we're about. Like, it's not what Miles is about. It's all like, what's next? And so, um, that's you know that's like the under underlying everything is we're questioning whether um, it has to be a certain way whether movies have to be a certain way whether like cartoons have to be a certain way. That seems to resonate with uh, with the youngs. You the youth. I, I cannot even claim uh, a side. But everyone had a canon event. You could be a forty five year old mom right. at home and have like this yes. canon mm -hmm. event. Um, everybody has like an origin story, right? Yeah. And the other thing about the movie is like everybody's origin story is legit. Yeah. Right? You don't have to conform to like the way it was written. You can write your own. 
I love that you guys just boast some of the most incredible voice cast between folks like that started with it like Moore and Jake and uh, you also have folks like Haley. But then this time around you bring you know back folks like Mulaney but then also you add folks like Oscar Isaacs uh, and it's just like I feel Kaluuya. like it's yeah, Kaluuya. <laughs> Talk about those two additions in particular because like we put the paddle where it's like fresh in it especially his Spider-Man became I mean, yeah. also another one of those like cultural ones where people were really looking at Britpop and yeah. just that style in a very different way. It was actually uh, Daniel's Oscar speech when he thanked his uh, mom and dad for having sex that we realized- <laughs> I was like, has, I love this guy. He has the punk <laughs> spirit. We're like, this guy has to be the voice of Hobie Brown's by And he's Funk. funny, he's obviously an amazing actor, uh, but I don't know that everyone always gets to see his like playful side. Or You don't often Camden get to hear accent, his like man. home accent, yeah. and so, he was like, how do you want this guy to sound? Or like, where are you from? In Eng London, he's like, Camden is like, birthplace of punk, right on. Yeah. He's from Camden. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't know that. That's so yeah. great. That's so, so he great. just like brought uh, an authenticity and a spirit to that, like you can't recreate. Just real quick with Oscar Isaacs yeah. being so terrifying and menacing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you know, we've known Oscar since we were both, you know, working in uh, Star Wars world. And, uh, and, you know, on a lark, at the end of the last movie, we like call them as like, hey, can you do this like cameo? <laughs> you know, like it'll just be for a laugh. And then as we're writing the next one, we're like, I think Oscar needs to be like a, a pretty huge major part of this. <laughs> Not a lark anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, what a great actor to work with and who can put so much like subtlety in any line. And, uh, and finding a way to have that character be um, sympathetic. Yeah. As well as being incredibly aggro, uh, incredibly he, aggro. He yeah. like could find that level where you're not like this guy's the worst person in the world. You're like, oh, I see why he is this way right. and why he's he wrong, cares so but much. you understand why from his point of view he's right. What, what's, what's up with three? What's up? I literally asked it's you this happening. at the last That's right. one. I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? We're in the we're, middle of it. We're, we're, it's, we're working on it. Can you give me something? We got uh, me storyboard <laughs> artists boarding and animatics yeah. being built. And it is a, yeah, it's a film. Oh, come it on. It will come out in the future. And uh, hopefully, the hope is to be a very uh, satisfying conclusion to the trilogy. We imagine a future. And our imaginings horrify us. Ludwig, congratulations for a now this is your third Oscar nomination. Yeah. And that is kind of an incredible feat already to begin with. And what was it like that day? Because maybe it's old hat for you at this point. Did you wake up? What did you do? <laughs> no, it's 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 never it's never old hat. I haven't heard that saying by the way. But <laughs> it's never old hat. It's it was it was extremely ex you know exciting and I was so happy um, and surprised. We were also like we have sm very young kids now, so like any time you have a chance to sleep for a second longer, you know, you get it. So I'm, I'm also so, so used to uh, waking up very early in the morning, so we didn't put an alarm on. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, so I, I woke up around 6.30 or 6.45, and I looked at my phone first thing, or, or Serena looked at her phone, and we didn't have any texts. So I was like, oh, shit. Like maybe we didn't, yeah. maybe it didn't happen this time. Uh, and then we logged in and we, we went to the live thing and and they were, they were about to um, announce the last award, the last nomination. So yeah. I was like, okay, maybe, yeah, maybe this time it didn't, it didn't go, it, we didn't get nominated. Um, but then we kind of scrolled down and like, oh, we saw the, and then nope. the text, text started coming after 7 a.m. Oh, I was to say, I was like, I, that's what it is. You're a musician. All of your <laughs> yeah. friends are not up that early. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I guess so, yeah. Of like all your musician friends. And I know you have all these musician friends because the last time I got to see you was at the incredible concert that you guys did where you did a live orchestra here in Los Angeles, yeah. sold out in 38 minutes for people to see live uh, orchestration with a mm -hmm. film. Talk about that night and the incredible, I think you said six months journey for you guys to make that incredible moment happen. Yeah, it was, uh, I'm so glad you were there. I mean, it was such a special night and I, can't, I hope we get to do it again because the way that this, mo uh, this movie plays with mm -hmm. live musicians and how much live music there actually is in the film and obviously like, the experience of seeing the film in a concert hall and having a, a 55 piece orchestra and seeing them, you know, 46 string players moving their arms and like with the intensity of the movie, how you, it's almost like you're sitting at the edge of the seat and, and if you were able to 
move like that, you would, you know? Yeah, like, I, yeah. Um, and it was just a lot of work to get it prepared for that, to prepare for that concert because there's two hours and 43 minutes of music in the film. And a three it, hour film, so yeah, like barely any moments Exactly, of rest. and it took, you know, a year to write it and record it, and we recorded it with the orchestra at different times. And for the first time, put it all together so they can play it in one flawless performance and all these very, very complicated um, tempo changes. And we're also doing some interesting sound design with, with how we panned the orchestra from left to right. And But um, Serena uh, was very, my wife, she was very adamant that we need to make it perfect. And she also knows a lot of these musicians that played on the score and they were playing on the concert. So we, we, we kind of arranged it for the players and for mm -hmm. them, with the, having them in mind individually, and the result was was incredible. Breathtaking was what the result was. I yeah. will say that, and it was filmed with. I mean, like I will say that the crowd that night was a pretty heavy room. I'm not going to name drop everyone, <laughs> but of like think about a name that you would think to be there. They were probably there, and this is like the who's who. Like when I saw Kenny G, I'm like seriously, Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> like this dude knows everybody. Uh, but the other great moment of that night is I will forever remember it because it's probably the only time I'll ever hear Christopher Nolan talk about TikTok, and it was a relationship to your score and that musical drop, can you hear the music? I guess knowing some of the albums that you've worked on and some of the moments that you've been a part of, I assume that you think that an audience is gonna have a reaction. Did you think that that would be the song that is now like, it's a, a musical cue that is so identifiable, not just with the mo movie, but just mm -hmm. out there and mm -hmm. lives beyond the movie, I think in a lot of ways. Well, I, I would never in my wildest dream guess that it would have like two billion TikTok impressions, right? Um, but I knew the way Chris used the music in the film and in that montage, an incredible, beautiful montage, was extremely powerful. You can't deny that. Mm -hmm. Sitting in the theater, hearing the music and seeing that incredible montage, the visual and the audio together. So I knew that was a very, very powerful um, experience. And I think a lot of people, after they left the theater, wanted to get that feeling again. Mm -hmm. And it's always, baffles me and it's always so cool when when actually some of, of the music that you do get the life on its own you know after the film and I guess that that was one of those moments it was an incredible moment of like live movie and music sort of moving um, together is there is there a thought of yours of like a different aspect of doing this now more live? Like you said that you wanted to get a chance to do it again. Is that something that you're maybe trying to work for with the film or just maybe doing your music live more often? Uh, definitely, I think with Oppenheimer, we, Serena and I, we made it so, we put so much time and on my team and our orchestra, orchestrator and arranger and the copyists and my team, like we put so much time into it to make it perfect so with the thought in mind that maybe other orchestras around the world could pick this up and perform it in wow. concert halls um, and that was that was very exciting um, as for me uh, doing a, a live tour or a concert um, at some point n right now I'm, I'm I have some other project coming up but but um, you know I, I always I grew up playing on stage when I moved to LA to the States I thought that I would have to kind of put that on side. I mean, I'm a guitar player and a musician, first and foremost, when I got started. Um, but then touring with Childish, it was like made me realize, like, I can actually, I can actually play on stage again and do that thing and produce albums and and I always enjoy that. Um, and I could, as long as it's, it just has to be like a, a really amazing experience, you know. I don't want to just do something um, that's been done before. It's, it has to be something truly unique. Yeah, you definitely made history because I've noticed not everybody wants to do their little concert movies the way kind of like the way you were doing where it's not just a few selected songs where they're really like scoring it throughout and like mm -hmm. not saying they're, they're biting off you, but it is a little bit like so, like the biting your flow a little bit. I'll, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Uh, the last thing I was going to ask you um, sort of about this one is now that you're in this moment, there's a lot of collaborators I'm sure maybe that are reaching out and I don't want you to maybe name drop to be like, oh, I'd love to work with this director, but is there a particular genre or type of movie that you haven't got to do yet that you would like to try? Like whether it be maybe a horror type thing or, or is there just an area maybe that you haven't got to explore as a composer that you're really interested in exploring? Maybe it's a rom-com, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I feel like I've done a lot of different genres 
and that's I and that's why I love film scoring because you could do any type of genre. But one of my favorite directors that I haven't worked with is um, also Swedish, Ruben Ostlund. Oh yeah, and I ran into another him a couple, round. And yeah, so many other ones. Yeah, I ran into him a couple of events, and he's such a great guy. And I always love everything that he does. Like his films, so exciting and 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 different and unique. And but I also think the way that he uses music in the films very 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 um it's perfect. And now I'm just dreaming about Ruben, Maz, and you together, like as the Swedish triumvirate. Like, please make this happen. Can we please make this happen? I don't know. Who do I need to tell? Make this happen. <laughs> Call the king of Sweden. <laughs> Call the king. He could make it happen. <laughs> this is Bella. Bye, bye. Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Holly, congratulations on your Oscar nomination. I know we got to speak to you before this sort of like whirlwind happened, but I have to think one of the best moments for you with this was when you got to do the art exhibit at the LA Costume and Design Academy here. Like that was just one of the greatest exhibits I've ever seen. Talk to me about that moment. Oh, it was wonderful. I, you know, I, I loved working with the people at FIDM. Um, they did such a brilliant job and, you know, I couldn't quite visualize what they were imagining. I thought it would be like a little display in the corner of a room. But when, you know, when I got there, I walked in. It was it really took my breath away. It was a proper, proper thing. And you know, with all of the video clips and props and things, I, I yeah, I was really overwhelmed. Thinking back to when you guys were first like doing mm -hmm. rehearsals and you and Emma, I know her journey through becoming Bella, and I, I think she says, you know, it's a love story with yourself. The idea of her doing that is told through her clothing. And I'd love for you to talk about how you, Yorgos, and Emma really sort of made that journey of somebody who lives without self-consciousness but still finds a way to be completely authentic. Well, I mean, that really comes from her performance. The costumes just support that journey, really. It's quite a beast working that out. Um, I had a, a, a huge book, like a big eight massive thing. I split the film into four chapters. Um, I, I broke it all down into bits and, and basically just felt like I had to have four different approaches and for each chapter to tell a slightly different story in her development sartorially. So the first bit is all about her being a child in, in, in grown-up's clothes and um, it was about putting her in these Victorian, you know, combinations, but taking things away so she doesn't ever wear the corset. Yeah. You know, often we missed out skirts and things, and those conversations would be, you know, going on between Emma and Yorgos and I constantly. Even on the day, you know, when we we're getting her dressed in the morning, things would be subject to change, and you know, we developed the costume so that they became a little bit more grown up, a bit more sheer as she matures, mm -hmm. to the point where by the end of the film, she's, you know, she's in a pair of Colots and a jumper, you know, it's just clothes. I know we talk a lot about Bella, but another costume or another actor that you costume that I absolutely loved is what you did with Mark Ruffalo. Because <laughs> I feel like when I, this is a very different look for him, this character, and yeah. so much of that is how he literally looks like a peacock. Talk about sort of the journey uh, to yeah. sort of bring him out through the costuming. So, so we looked at these um, satirical drawings of men, or like illustrations of men, like sort of cartoons. Um, and often the men, the British sort of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the ruling class, you know, the imperialist rulers of the world, you know, they're wearing these ridiculous outfits that kind of create a strange um, posture. So their chests are often pumped out, they have top hats, they have, um, their bottoms are sticking out, they have sticks, they have these collars that lift their necks. So they look, to me, they look ridiculous and I wanted to capture some of that in, in his clothing. And so we played around with body padding and you know, pumping his chest out, giving him a more curvaceous bottom and thighs. We gave him a phallus. We also corseted him because men of that period also wore corsets. So we really wanted to play with these ideas to give him this really contorted body shape that would say something about his sort of sense of superiority and his position, you know, within the patriarchy at that time. I love that. One of the best things I love talking to the costumers is the crazy things y'all source. It seems like there's always some like, oh, we got this at the Victorian, da -da. give me a crazy mm -hmm. like, we didn't know where we were getting this, and but we got it on the day of, and it's got a great story behind it. Um, so, so Swiney, the Madame Swiney, wears this dress that I designed that has hands that are kind of hugging her body as if someone is kind of embracing her from behind. And I, I, we weren't quite sure how to do the hands, and uh, 
we were walking around, a, myself and, 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 a, and a couple of people from the team were walking around a flea market in, in Budapest, and there was a door knocker with a little hand on it. So that was it, we got that and made a cast of it. So that was, uh, that was one of those moments, just a totally sort of auspicious, happy accident. Since you're here today, you're going to get to see some of your fellow nominees. Who are you excited to see inside? I mean, there's some pretty great names in there. It's, it's a bit overwhelming, isn't it? I'm really looking forward to seeing Dave Crossman and Jacqueline Duran, who, oh, are, yeah. who are some of the other costume nominees, because they're people that I've worked with. And, and you know, the last time I saw them, I was about you know, very young and sitting on the back of a costume truck um, having a laugh with them. So that will be really fun. I mean, there are many people that I'm very excited to see. Awesome. Yeah. And then tell me about nominations morning. Where were you? Who were you with? Who was that first phone call? Oh, um, so my kids were all were both off school with, with, with sickness, very, very ill, and sort of lying on the floor vomiting into their own hands. And I took the call whilst kind of navigating sick buckets. It was, it was like a working mum's sort of ultimate, you know, comedy sketch. They say you are the finest, wealthiest, and most beautiful people on God's earth. They outsmart everybody. They have the same. Who gets the oil? Congratulations, Rodrigo. I'm so Thank excited you. for your Oscar nomination. And I will say, <laughs> obviously, with a film directed by Martin Scorsese, people are always talking about the cinematography, the look of it. How is that shorthand that you guys have sort of developed now? Because I think what, the first one was at Silence, and now... The, the first was uh, The Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Yes. And so now, coming back to this one, is it one of those things where you just kind of know? Or what, what are those first conversations with him like? Well, it, it changes every film, yeah. and, and this one took a lot of research and a lot of digging in. But uh, yes, there is more of a short, shorthand communication. But mostly, what I love is that he communicates with uh, just uh, emotional terms instead of technical. Mm. He doesn't talk about the specific focal length or these sort of things. He just says, "I wanted to feel this way or that way, or maybe it should be more extreme or more this or that," and and then I figure out what that means and how to translate it to imagery. And uh, it was a really interesting and fun, for me, the, our collaboration, figuring out the, the look of Killers of the Flower Moon. It really required a lot of testing and throwing out ideas, trying different things. It was a great process. Not to make you have to untranslate that, but if you could now take away the technical thing of what you did and translate what was the look of Killers of the Flower Moon into like, more, I would say, adjective type words, what would be those sort of like descriptors that you would put around it? Well, we were telling a, a story that hasn't really been told much. It has been shown in different ways, and in the movie itself, you see newsreel footage, you see some home movies done by the Osage that we reproduced, and uh, at the end, you see a radio show telling the story of the Osage, and this was in the 30s. So we thought that a way of representing this storytelling was through the images of still photography or emulating mm. the beginning of color still photography, for example. I gave part of the film that the, the color of autochrome, which mm. is a, a type of color photography, the beginnings of it. So it was um, an exploration of how do we represent visually the story of the Osage and how they see the world and how we, do we represent the, the story of the descendants of the European immigrants, the white people, you know, and how do we differentiate those worlds and how does it evolve the, the story visually? How do we evolve with the drama of the characters? So that, those are the conversations, you know, how do we put the audience in the, in the shoes of these characters? That's my job. One of the things that Marty's so good about is that he pulls inspiration from films. Like he talked a lot about some of the um, the early westerns that it was inspiring him, but also a film like The Heiress. How much do you, as a DP, how much does that influence your shot list, and how much do you have to just let all that go away? Are there those moments where you're like, no, this is this is our you know Olivia de Havilland moment with Lily. We've got to make it look as close as possible, or is it really just a feel thing? Yes, in fact, even though, obviously, Martin Scorsese is the cinephile of the eras, you know, he's in every movie, and, uh, but it's, it's not something that we really discuss, this should feel like this movie or that movie. It's exclusively about this one film, and what we have behind us in our cinematic culture, that's in us, so it's, it doesn't seem necessary to specifically talk about references. Sometimes we do, but for the most part, it's, you know, this, these are the characters and, you know, how do we make it feel this way? And sometimes I use 
images, photos as yeah. references, and okay, how about this color, you know, or this type of framing, and and he'll design shots that also are, for him it's a, for the editing process, you know, the energy of the film at a certain point in the story. So, and and we you know work together on on figuring all that out. What would be the most surprising thing about being on a set with Martin Scorsese? The most surprising thing? For other people, like they wouldn't, like I think they expect certain things coming with it, but the thing that they'd maybe be surprised about when you're on set with him and what you sort of discover. I think it's uh, Scorsese's sense of humor. Mm. You know, he, he is, you know, intense in the sense that he's passionate, you know, and, and, and he really wants to, you know, focus and make everything the way it should be. But uh, he, once, once he's warmed up, he's just having fun and just, you know, joking and, and I love that too. One of the best things I think about a, a DP and a director is it's really symbiotic relationship, probably as close as it gets to maybe like an editor. You guys are right there at the birth and then also as it's sort of like being delivered. Um, and because it's that kind of intimate relationship, that also means that there's going to be good days and bad days and there's going to be difficult days. What was the most difficult day for you guys on set with Killers of the Flower Moon as far as what you mm. had to execute and what you had to go into? That one that you're like, all right, we know this is going to be a day that we've got to do a lot and, and we've, got to, we've got to sort of build it through this relationship and to make it happen. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of those challenging days. Uh, and uh, I would say maybe the, for me, the, the toughest was uh, the aftermath of the explosion of, of uh, Rita and Bill's house. That was intense in many ways. And, and certainly uh, just from a practical standpoint, getting the day done, the night done, you know, all the shots we needed to do. But also creating the, the, the mood with the lighting and, and getting the camera to the positions we need them to be, for example, in the middle of this rubble, you know, that, that was kind of a sculpture created by Jack Fisk in the art department. How do we navigate that? It was done actually with the pieces of the house where we actually shot the scenes before it exploded. It's the same place. Wow. That house was going to be sold and torn down, so we shot there in Fairfax, right there, the same neighborhood where the original thing happened. And they destroyed the house after we shot the house built, you know, and created a crater. So it was full of nails and, you know, the, 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 it, was, it was tricky navigating. But um, uh, it's one of my favorite scenes. It's very powerful. And, and just being there throughout the movie, just being in Fairfax, being in the place where things happened was extremely powerful to all of us. I love that. Um, I've been asking everyone this. Obviously, you know, four-time nominee. It's not like this is new. But where were you when you got the call? Maybe on set. <laughs> where were you? Um, and who told you? It was your first phone call? Yes, I was. Uh, I was in Mexico City, actually. Uh, I was uh, working there. Uh, I'm from there, but I was um, at that moment. I'm, I'm um, editing a movie that I directed, and uh, so it was, you know, early in the morning. So I, I, we, I FaceTime with my wife, Monica. So, so we were both on FaceTime and I saw on my laptop, I connected and, and we saw the news together, you know, even though we were, she was, you know, back here in LA and I was in Mexico City. So it was, uh, yeah, it was very exciting. And, and just sharing that with her, that moment was beautiful. It's such a pleasure to meet you. You are so sweet. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for doing this. It's so generous. Oh, well, I want you to tell the story, right, don't I? First of all, Sammy, Alex, congratulations Thank on you your so Oscar much. nominations. You're in a very interesting class because there are three writing couples that are yeah. all nominated here. So, like, is there a couple fight? Is there like a thing where like we're better because ours was this? Like, do you do that a little bit, or is it just like all camaraderie in the sense of like we know what you went through? <laughs> oh yeah, no, just dinner parties, like classic yeah. dinner parties with the couple, big sales, board games. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Um, <laughs> I do think it's interesting with all three of those films, um, there is a pair and a couple at the sort of the center mm -hmm. of every single one of them. And I will say of all of them, there's levels of dysfunction. <laughs> Yours kind of takes the cake. Uh, <laughs> but talk about, you know, when you guys sort of sat down to tell this story, which I know is not specifically from the famous story of Mary Kay Letourneau and, and Billy, but the idea that it was inspired by it. What about that story really sort of intrigued y'all for a full length feature? Well, I think it was just that we wanted to look at um, sort of the way that the tabloid culture of the 90s has bled into this true crime um, mania, really, mm. that we're in right now, and setting something 20 years after an event, a tabloid event, felt like it gave us enough room to really investigate it, to look at yeah. it, to 
um, be able to play with tone mm. and, and having an actress be our, right. a television actress coming in uh, being our entry point felt like an interesting way to look at that. And have elements of satire and the Hollywood machine mm -hmm. be part of the story. Speaking of that part, you definitely got a like a big taste of Hollywood with your director in the sense of like when he's like, yeah, this is the next film I want to shoot. That is pretty incredible. I mean, this is the guy that did Carol. I mean, he's had uh, a history of doing really intense, um, sometimes tragic love stories. Uh, talk about when y'all got that phone call when he said that he wanted to direct it and then knowing that because of that, you were going to be able to get talents like Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. Yeah, no, it's un... Uh, describable yeah. really to get a call like that because I mean Todd is just a, a hero and and a genius and um, his the people that come with him Christine Michon and Pam Koffler who are nominated for past lives mm -hmm. as producers you know these are just the most incredible artists and and it's it, it's amazing it really is speaking of another great caller great moment did you wake up nominations morning did you not want to know like how did you do it Because like one of you may say I want to wake up and the other one would be like not on your life and then you have to have a couple moment about where you ended up so what was the plan we did the full yeah. wake up 5 a.m. really yeah we wanted the tea. full experience yeah. yeah it was it was yeah it was exciting I mean we didn't know how it was what was gonna happen but it felt um you know may as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately the writers event is late um, so you guys don't get to do that sort of moment with other your fellow writers, but you've been on this journey together where you guys have been at a ton of the award shows already. Um, but now this is like I say, graduation day. Like you all have been kind of doing like this. This right. your this is your your class, as it were, of these nominees. Who are you most excited to maybe you know brush elbows with inside or get a chance to see that you haven't or get a chance to reconnect with? I mean, Jonathan Glazer for sure. I, <laughs> the idea that he might even be here at all, I'm like, how is that real? Like, it doesn't <laughs> really? seem right. I think he's just so brilliant. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, and Jody Foster's probably going to be in there, right? I mean, that's a yeah. big one. That's That would be yeah. a shock. I've not met her. And, so many incredible um, people. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a Miyazaki's list. Miyazaki's nominated. I'm like, yeah. surely he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to be here, but I, because trust me, we tried to get him for an interview. He's not. He's busy right, making yeah, his next yeah. movie, yeah. pretending he like he's retiring. <laughs>